Dear friends, good day and welcome to the fifth episode of our Learning Box series, in which I'm going to try and share with you my method of practicing. Before we begin, I very much care to tell you, though, that whatever I'm going to do now, which obviously works for me, may well not work for you. Practicing, just like everything else in music, is an intensely personal thing. And, you know, it is very important that everybody find their own way to achieve the ideal result. For instance, yesterday I had a nice conversation with Maestro Vincenzo Magia, the artistic director of the concert series I'll take part in next Sunday. And we were talking, you know, all things pianist techniques, posture, and stuff like that, and this gave me the idea to start from posture. As you can see, I like to sit very low at the keyboard, and this is due to a number of reasons, the most important of which, for me at least, is that by having the forearm this low next to the keyboard, I am forced to articulate very much when I play. And this, in turn, allow me to have absolute control over the sound which for me is very important. Also, <laughs> pianists are a little bit like operators, you see. You know? <laughs> a teacher of mine used to liken pianists to the pilots of bombers, you see. They may press the button that releases the bomb, but the real damage happens when the bomb hits the ground. Well, the same very much is here. We can do whatever on the keyboard, but the real action happens in there in that magical region in which the hammer strikes the string and creates music. Also for this reason, by sitting a little bit lower, I'm closer to the magical region where everything happens. And I like to have this illusion of creating a circular motion. I give an input on the keyboard, the sound happens there, comes back to me, and it happens all over again uh, in this sort of circular motion. And this for me is very important because it allows me to have absolute control on everything that goes on. Not only when I give concert, but most importantly, when I practice. Now, today we're going to practice the sixth and final movement of Johann Sebastian Bach's Capriccio on the departure of his beloved brother, the Fuga all'imitazione di Posta. And because this is a fugue, it requires a little bit of a special approach. Now, I better come clean at the beginning. I am a little bit old-fashioned in these things. And whenever I play fugues, I like to emphasize very much each entrance of the main subject. Now, if you want a little bit of a refresher on what a fugue is, etc., I suggest you watch the last episode in which I gave a little outline on how a fugue is composed. Anyway, by wanting to emphasize each entrance of the subject by default I need to give a little bit less to the other voices and therefore it's quite complicated to, to do it in a way that sounds natural. But before we get to the performance standard, before we are sure enough in, in our play we need to practice, and I learned my method of practicing from a genius pianist from Ukraine, really. His name was Shura Tcharkovsky, and I admired him very, very much and tried to emulate him at every step of the way. Of course, I felt badly because he was a genius and I'm not. But through Shura, I did inherit, if you wish, the system of practicing extremely slowly, which it may sound easy, but it, actually it is not, because the trick is to practice from memory. Now, I memorize this music, uh, of course, also because I sit so low. For me, it's, it's quite uncomfortable to read music. I need to keep my head high up like this. Therefore, I memorize the music, and I practice it at an incredibly low speed. If you imagine that more or less the speed of the piece is this, my usual practicing speed is this. I 
takes a lot of patience and a lot of time and many of you may wonder what's, what's the point in playing so slowly? Well, at the risk of repeating myself, the point is to have absolutely everything under control. For instance, I have decided to copy a little bit Signor Busoni, whose revision is here behind me, at the beginning of the piece, and splitting the notes between the two hands. This makes it a little bit more interesting for me, of course, but it also helps me to phrase, to give these little inflections to the subject that I think are necessary. Let me show it to you. as the music progresses and the textures get more complex, we need to find ways of executing all these notes as easily or comfortably as possible, but always with an eye, or rather an ear, to the final result. The only thing that matters is what is going to go out to our audience. And I'm going to give you just one example, which is very emblematic. Here are bar 22 and following. The main subject of the fugue, which I want to be heard, is in the middle of the texture. It's here. It is accompanied at the basis by the counter subject. variation on the soprano. If we put it all together, we get this. And so on. Now, you will have seen that I have perform the little hand crossing in there. This is not at all marked by Bach. Bach only gave us beautifully laid out music. But I want the D, the main subject, to be heard. And it would be very difficult and uncomfortable to bring up the D if I also had to play the soprano line above. Therefore, I decided to play these four notes with the left hand so that I can be sure, absolutely sure, that this D is going to come up on top, as I want. This, of course, is repeated all over the place in all sorts of pieces, but you need to be a little bit creative when you're learning new music, thinking always to the final result, what it's going to sound like when it goes out. Now, uh, I mentioned in the first episode that a very important element for me is this, the little notebook. This one is devoted to the capriccio and it already has quite a bit of scribbling in it. And an important thing that I do every day is that I write down the time of my practices. So, I need a timepiece, which is here. It is now 16.56. I'm going to write it down here. 1656, and I am pretty much ready to start. A word of warning if you are not a pianist or a keyboard aficionado, you may as well, as well skip forward because this is a very long and not terribly interesting thing, but I said I would show you how I practice, so here we go. This is me practicing the fuga a limitazione di posta.
exactly half an hour or mostly very slow practicing. And this is how I ply my trade, so to speak. I, I, this is how I practice virtually all music. Now, admittedly, when I have to do something that is physically taxing, like you know, double octaves or something very fast and complicated, sometimes I also try to perform it here. I want to try maybe to build up the muscle and find different solutions. I show you here bar 23 where I do a little hands crossing, but this happens all over the place. And we always try and adjust the score in, in the most feasible, most comfortable fashion for us to play, leaving the notes unaltered, of course. This is not cheating, this is just uh, experience teaching us how to make our life that little bit simpler. And on that note, I think perhaps I should try and play for you this marvelous Fuga a limitazione di posta. At least to have a look where it is now. Today is Wednesday, almost six o'clock in the afternoon, and I have to play it on Sunday morning. So let's see. This is Bach, Fuga a limitazione di posta, the sixth and final movement of the Capriccio on the departure of his most beloved brother. So looking forward to play it on Sunday morning for Domenica in Musica, a piece of Palazzo Blue. And I do believe I'm going to have a lot of fun with it, because ultimately the only way that my audience is going to have a lot of fun is if I am having a lot of fun playing for them. And it is always a huge privilege, as it is indeed, to share my music here with you. And on that note, thank you so very much for following this episode and the program, and indeed, see you next time.